Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. Well, that's me, in case you're wondering. Today, we are reading Chapter 20 of Pawn of Prophecy by David Eddings. And as always, you should buy the original book to support the original work. Chapter 20. King and Hegg's study was a large, cluttered room high in a square tower. Books, bound in heavy leather, lay everywhere, and strange devices with gears and pulleys and tiny brass chains sat on tables and stands. Intricately drawn maps and beautiful illuminations were painted up on the walls, and the floor was littered with scraps of parchment covered with tiny writing. King Enheg, his coarse black hair hanging in his eyes, sat at a slanted table in the soft glow of a pair of candles studying a large book written on thin sheets of crackling parchment. The guard at the door led them and let them enter without a word, and Mr. Wolf stepped briskly into the center of the room. You wanted to see us, Enheg? The King of Cherok straightened from his book and laid it aside. Belgarath, he said with a short nod of greeting. Polgara, he glanced at Garion, who stood uncertainly near the door. I meant what I said earlier, Aunt Paul said. I'm not going to let him out of my sight until I know for certain that he's out of the reach of the Grawlm Asherag. Anything you say, Polgara, and Hegg has said. Come in, Garion. I see that you're continuing your studies, Mr. Wolf said approvingly, glancing at the littered room. There's so much to learn, and Hegg said with a helpless gesture that included all the welter of books and papers and strange machines. I have a feeling that I might have been happier if you'd never introduced me to this impossible task. You asked me, Wolf said simply. You could have said no, and Hegg laughed. Then his brutish face turned serious. He glanced out once at Garin and began to speak in an obviously oblique manner. I don't want to interfere, he said, but the behavior of this Asherah concerns me. Garin moved away from Aunt Paul and began to study one of the strange little machines sitting on the nearby table, being careful not to touch it. We'll take care of Asherak, Aunt Paul said, but Aang Hag persisted. There have been rumors for centuries that you and your father have been protecting... He hesitated, glancing at Gary, and then continued smoothly. A certain thing that must be protected at all costs. Several of my books speak of it. You read too much, Aang Hag, Aunt Paul said. Aang Hag laughed again. It passes the time, Pulgara, he said. The alternative is drinking with my earls, and my stomach's getting a little delicate for that. And my ears as well. Have you any idea of how much noise a hall full of drunk cheriks can make? My books don't shout or boast, and they don't fall down or slide under the tables and snore. They're much better company, really. Foolishness, Aunt Paul said. We're all foolish at one time or another, and Hegg said philosophically. But let's get back to this other matter. If those rumors I mentioned are true, aren't you taking some serious risks? Your search is likely to be very dangerous. No place is really safe, Mr. Wolf said. Why take chances you don't have to, and Hegg said. Asherak isn't the only Grawlum in the world, you know. I can see why they call you and Hegg the Sly, Wolf said with a smile. Wouldn't it be safer to leave this certain thing in my care until you return, and Hegg suggested. We've already found that not even Val Alorn is safe from the Grawlums, and Hegg, Aunt Paul said firmly. The mines of Cathal Murgos and Garog Nadrak are endless, and the Grawlums have more gold at their disposal than you could even imagine. How many others like Jarvik have they bought? The Old Wolf and I are very experienced at protecting this certain thing you mentioned. It'll be safe with us. Thank you for your concern, however, Mr. Wolf said. The matter concerns us all, and Hegg said. Garin, despite his youth and occasional recklessness, was not stupid. It was obvious they were talking of what they were talking about involved him in some way, and quite possibly had to do with the mystery of his parentage as well. To conceal the fact that he was listening as hard as he could, he picked up a small book bound in a strangely textured black leather. He opened it, but there were neither pictures nor illustrations, merely a spidery looking script that seemed strangely repulsive. Aunt Paul who always seemed to know what he was doing, looked over at him. What are you doing with that? He said sharply. Just looking, he said. I can't read. Put it down immediately, she told him. King and Hegg smiled. You wouldn't be able to read it anyway, Garion, he said. It's written in Old Angorak. 
What are you doing with that filthy thing anyway? Aunt Paul asked Aunt Hag. You of all people should know that it's forbidden. It's only a book, Paul, Mr. Wolf said. It doesn't have any power unless it's permitted to. Besides, Aunt Hag said, rubbing thoughtfully at the side of his face, the book gives us clues to the mind of our enemy. That's always a good thing to know. You can't know Torak's mind, Aunt Paul said, and it's dangerous to open yourself to him. He can poison you without you even knowing what's happening. I don't think there's any danger of that, Paul, Wolf said. Aunt Hag's mind is well trained enough to avoid the traps in Torak's book. They're pretty obvious, after all. And Hag looked across the room at Garion and beckoned to him. Garion crossed the, and stood in front of the King of Cherik. You're an observant young man, Garion, and Hag said gravely. You've done me a service today, and you can call on me any time for service in return. Know that Ang Hag of Cherik is your friend. He extended his right hand, and Garion took it in his own without thinking. King and Hag's eyes grew suddenly wide, and his face paled slightly. He turned Garen's hand over and looked down at the silvery mark on the boy's palm. Then Aunt Paul's hands were also there, firmly closing Garen's fingers and removing him from Enheg's grip. It's true then, Enheg said softly. Enough, Aunt Paul said. Don't confuse the boy. Her hands were still firmly holding Garen's. Come along, dear, she said. It's time to finish packing. And she turned and led him from the room. Garen's mind was racing. What was there about the mark on his hand that had so startled Enheg? The birthmark, he knew, was hereditary. Aunt Paula had once told him that his father's hand had the same mark. But why would that be of interest to Enheg? It had gone too far. His need to know became more unbearable. He had to know about his parents, about Aunt Paul, about all of it. If the answers hurt, then he'd just have to hurt. At least he would know. The next morning was clear, and... They left the palace for the harbor quite early. They all gathered in the courtyard where the sleighs waited. There's no need for you to come out in the cold like this, Merrill, Beric told his fur-robed wife as she mounted the sleigh beside him. I have a duty to see my lord safely to his ship, she replied with an arrogant lift of her chin. Beric sighed. Whatever you wish, she said. With King Enheg and Queen Islana in the lead, the slaves world out of the courtyard and into the snowy streets. The sun was very bright and the air was crisp. Garion rode silently with Silken Hedar. Why so quiet, Garion? Silk asked. A lot of things have happened here that I don't understand, Garion said. No one can understand everything, Hedar said rather sententiously. Cheriks are a violent and moody people, Silk said. They don't even understand themselves. It's not just the Cherix, Garen said, struggling with the words. It's Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf and Asherak. All of it. Things are happening too fast. I can't get it all sorted out. Events are like horses, Hedder told him. Sometimes they run away. After they've run for a while, though, they'll start to walk again. Then there'll be time to put everything together. I hope so, Garen said doubtfully and fell silent again. The sleigh came around a corner into the broad square before the Temple of Balar. The blind woman was there again, and Garen realized that he had been half expecting her. She stood on the steps of the temple and raised her staff. Unaccountably, the horses, which pulled the sleigh, stopped, trembling despite the urgings of the driver. Hail, great one, the blind woman said. I wish thee well on thy journey. The sleigh in which Garen was riding had stopped closest to the temple steps. It seemed that the old woman was speaking to him. Almost without thinking, he answered, Thank you, but why do you call me that? She ignored the question. Remember me, she commanded, bowing deeply. Remember, Mart J, when thou comest into thine inheritance. It was the second time she'd said that, and Garion felt a sharp pang of curiosity. What inheritance, he demanded. But Beric was roaring with fury and struggling to throw off the fur robe and draw his sword at the same time. King Enheg was also climbing down from his sleigh, his coarse face livid with rage. No, Aunt Paul said sharply from nearby. I'll tend to this. She stood up. Hear me, witch woman, she said in a clear voice, casting back the hood of her cloak. I think you see too much with those blind eyes of yours. I'm going to do you a favor so that you'll no longer be troubled by the darkness and these disturbing visions which grow out of it. Strike me down if it please thee, Polgara, the old woman said. I see what I see. 
I won't strike you, Marche, Aunt Paul said. I'm going to give you a gift instead. She raised her hand in a brief and curious gesture. Garion saw it happen quite plainly, so there was no way he could later persuade that it had all been some trick of the eye. He was looking directly at Marche's face and saw the white film drain down off her eyes like milk draining down inside of a glass. The old woman stood frozen to the spot as the bright blue of her eyes emerged from the film which had covered them, and then she screamed. She shell held up her hands, looked at them, and screamed again. There was a in her scream a wrenching note and of indescribable loss. What did you do, Queen Islana demanded. I gave her back her eyes, Aunt Paul said, sitting down again and rearranging the fur robe about her. You can do that? Islana asked, her face blanching and her voice weak. Can't you? It's a simple thing, really. But, Queen Peren objected, with her eyes restored, she'll lose that other vision, won't she? I imagine so, Aunt Paul said. But that's a small price to pay, isn't it? So she'll no longer be a witch, then, Peren pressed. She wasn't really a very good witch anyway, Aunt Paul said. Her vision was clouded and uncertain. It's better this way. She won't be disturbing herself and others with shadows anymore. She looked at King Enheg, who sat frozen with awe beside his half-fainting queen. Shall we continue, she asked calmly. Our ship is waiting. The horses, as if released by her, way her words, leaped forward, and the sleighs sped away from the temple, spraying snow from the runners. Garion glanced back once. Old Mart J stood on the steps of the temple, looking at her two outstretched hands and sobbing uncontrollably. We've been privileged to witness a miracle, my friends, Hadar said. I gather, however, that the beneficiary was not very pleased with it, Silk said dryly. Remind me not to offend Polgara. Her miracles seem to have two edges to them.